string that was within uh, the config of worm. And it created this, it created this auto, auto run that in file in the root of the infected USB drive. And so when the victim inserted that USB drive into their system, what does Windows do? It brings up a pop-up window that says, what do you want to do? And usually you've got two options that most people care about. One option is to run the program that is supposed to run when you insert the key. And another option is safer. That, that other option is just to browse contents of that USB drive. And look at the auto run that in file that was on the configure infected USB key. This particular command specifies that the message the victim should be presented with to, brow, to, to run the program actually states open file folder to view files. So you see, the victim is presented with this dialog box, and what are the two options? You can open folder to view files, or you can open folder to view files. Both seem pretty safe, and the victim is probably going to pick the first one. But the first one is actually tied to an action that runs the malicious program. So the attackers are getting really creative. You, uh, there's, there's some psychological factors here. They recognize that most people are going to pay attention to what's listed first and probably going to click on that one. So, so that's very interesting. You, you've got these multiple levels of social engineering built into little things like dialog boxes. And somebody really put a lot of thought into this. Now here's another example of social engineering making use of these alternative um, channels of communication. And this is a story that uh, appeared in the news, what, about a year, I'm sorry, maybe a month and a half ago. Uh, uh, Gawker is a, is a set of sites that are very popular. Uh, Gizmodo, anybody likes Gizmodo, right? They have a po very popular blog about gadgets. So their sales department that sells advertisement on their blogs got, got a call, got an email from somebody who wanted to place ads on their site. And here's what that email looked like. Um, well, the, the person emailed, and he claims to be coming from a well-known media and advertising company. And he said that we want to place ads on your properties, and we want to do that by the end of this month. Anybody who works with sales, they recognize the importance of closing a deal by the end of this month. So the attacker said, the, the attacker made sure that they're going to get the salesperson's attention. Hey, you can close a deal at the end of this month, and the deal is pretty sizable, $25,000. So that caught the salesperson's attention. And so they the attacker engaged them initially via email, but he was also very willing to talk on the phone with them. And that really helped lower the salesperson's guard. And in their interactions with the salesperson that spanned several days, they really got convinced that they're working with a real, real executive working for a real advertising company. And they got scammed because the ads that they were displaying, they, they looked like this. They were advertising Suzuki, but this was not a Suzuki-sponsored campaign because the ads were actually infecting visitors to this website with uh, malicious software. So they were serving uh, infected PDF files. And this is incredible because the attacker was willing to invest a lot of effort into targeting these companies, this company Gawker, but they got a high payoff on their investment because they, they run some very popular sites. What's, what's interesting to me from this attack is that really there was very little indication that the salesperson could have had that they're dealing with a scammer. The email messages came from a domain name that looked very similar to the domain name associated with a legitimate advertising company. The email messages actually spoke the language of the trade. And the person interacting with them on the, on the phone, I mean, they use the lingo that you're expected to use if you are in the advertisement world. There was no accent. There was no sense that the person is uh, trying to scam them. So they fell for this. Why did they fall, fall for this? I, I think it would have been less likely if the communications of the attacker were limited just, just to the email messages. But he, he went to the phone. And people trust somebody who's on the phone. Sometimes when somebody emails me, I, I naturally feel more comfortable if I maybe meet them at a conference. Well, who knows if they're supposed to be here? Uh, I feel more trusting if I actually get a chance to speak to them on the phone. Well, who knows if this is the person's real phone number. So those were some examples of attackers relying on alternative channels of communication to lower our guard and to influence us into taking their actions. Uh, and by the way, the, the attack on Gawker, the same exact attack was used to place ads on other high-profile sites, like the New York Times fell for this uh, several months prior. So, so fascinating how effective scammers are at social engineering us. So another set of techniques that I have seen very effective in the world of social engineering uh, deal
deal with making sure that the message is personally relevant to the victim. Um, and uh, I remember uh, reading uh, uh, a blog where, where the author said, I think it was Seth Godin, and he said, people don't want to receive and read email. Nobody cares about email. They want to receive me mail. Right? So you're going to read a message if it's about you, if it's relevant to your job, if it's relevant to your family. So attackers recognize that, and they use that as part of their social engineering tactics. So here's some examples. In this case, this was a variant of the whale deck worm. And I thought it was a very clever scheme. You see, what the whale deck worm did is it spanned people, and it said that there was a, a, news, a breaking news that just occurred in their town. There was a bomb that exploded. And they were invited to click on a link. And when they clicked on a link, they got a message like this. Powerful explosion burst this morning. They caught the victim's attention. How? Because they used the geolocation database to determine where the victim was coming from. And they customized this link to give the name of the town or of the city from where the victim was browsing. So I was browsing from New York. So they said, oh, yeah, this blast occurred in New York. If you were browsing from um, uh, Oklahoma, that's where it would give you that locale. So the message is personally relevant. Now I'm really interested, and I want to read more about this. But if I want to read more, or rather see a video feed, what I need to do, download a video player to read more. But they got me hooked, because this is personally relevant to me. So that's an effective tactic. How else do you make sure that the message is personally relevant? Well, you spoof the origin of the message to look like it comes from a trusted source. And lately, we've seen a, a rise in email messages that look like they come uh, as uh, confirmations to shipping packages. Well, here's, here's one example. The, uh, this message looks like it comes from the UPS. And the message comes to you. you now, UPS, you're used to receiving mail confirmations from them. You kind of trust that it's a company that, that has their act together. And the message says that we couldn't deliver a package to you. Now, when somebody tells me that they're trying to deliver a package to me, I want to get the package. Because I'm curious. Hey, free stuff. I didn't expect anything. I'd like to see what's in it. But guess what? They missed me. I wasn't home. And they're telling me that to get that package that came out of nowhere that I'm really interested in, I've got to print, this, um, uh, print this, this invoice copy and bring it to the UPS office. So if I print it, it's probably going to be a malicious executable or a malicious PDF file. And that's how they got me. There are two things that are going on here that are important for social engineering. One is that it comes from a company from whom I'm used to receiving such messages, even though it's a little bit strange to me to see the name of the company actually spelled out. Nobody calls UPS United Parcel Service of America anymore. But I guess the attacker maybe thought they'd give the added legitimacy to this message by calling it the United Parcel Service of America, I think our next generation will probably won't even know what UPS actually stands for. Another message that was interesting is that this is a little bit confusing. Have you ever had to print some invoice to pick up your package? It's a little bit weird. And I find that a lot of effective social engineers, their goal is just to confuse their target. Um, because if the target is confused, then they might want to click or open a file just to get more information because it's uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable state psychologically for me to remain confused. And I want to clear that out. So a lot of the messages that you get sometimes won't quite make sense to you. But that's on purpose. They want to confuse you so that you take their action to clear up that confusion. Another example of personally relevant messages is a victim receiving content that they are expecting to receive. And the attackers are definitely willing to invest time into profiling their victims to understand what job do they have, what uh, companies do they interact with. Uh, and they send the messages that are personally relevant. And the first time that I saw something like this was really when people started discussing uh, targeted attacks on the um, human rights organizations that were uh, focusing on Tibet. And so uh, one sample message that such companies received had a text of, uh, attached here is the updated human rights report on Tibet issued by the Department of State of USA. Now, the person who received this message, they were actually very interested in the stuff because they were in that business. And so they opened a PDF document that, again, looked like it was very relevant to them. This was their life. They were interested in the stuff. And of course, it was a malicious PDF that exploited an unpatched vulnerability that got the system infected. So how do attackers know? 
what business you're in, what people you interact with. I mean, a lot of sources.